Welcome, welcome everyone to uh, panel four of day two of the fifth Air Quality Asia and Observer Research Foundation Roundtable Consultation on Air Pollution. Uh, I'm Tanushri Ganguly, your host and moderator for this session. Uh, I lead the Air Quality Program at the Council on Energy, Environment and Water. For our audiences who are not aware of CEEW, it's among Asia's leading policy research institutions. We use data, integrated analysis, and strategic outreach to explain and change the use, reuse, and misuse of resources. As you can see uh, today, I'm joined by a stellar panel. Uh, we have some of the leading voices on air pollution management in the country. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to briefly introduce uh, our panelists, and I'm gonna ask them to raise their hands and wave into the cameras as I introduce them. First, we have Ms. Anumita Roy Chaudhary. She is the Executive Director for Research and Advocacy at the Center for Science and Environment and a leading voice on air quality management in the country. Welcome, Ms. Anumita. We also have Abhishek Kumar. Abhishek is the founding partner of Indic Associates. He is a passionate advocate of citizen and consumer interest in policy making. We are also likely to be shortly joined by Dr. Mohammad Javed, who is a member of the parliament. He's also a medical practitioner. We will also be joined by Ms. Reena Gupta, who is the advisor to the government of National Capital Territory of Delhi on Environment Affairs. And she's of course, on numerous occasions, very articulately uh, talked about the need for a more centralized approach to air quality management in the country. Uh, before proceeding any further with the discussion, I'd like to thank Observer Research Foundation and Air Quality Asia for organizing this very timely conversation on the need for interstate coordination in air quality management. Uh, this discussion is also extremely timely because, you know, you all would have observed that the buzz around air pollution has slightly started dying, dying down, you know, as, as winters are receding. However, it's, it's important to note here that even today, you know, multiple cities across the country are actually reporting poor air quality levels. Also, what's interesting to observe is this winter particularly, uh, there were a series of extraordinary measures which were taken to combat rising air pollution levels in Delhi and the national capital region. Therefore, it becomes kind of important to sort of unpack what went right and what did not go as right. Closer to the subject in hand, which is the need for interstate coordination. I mean, all of us here certainly know that air pollution has no boundaries. Air is one thing which cannot be contained. But if you look at India's National Clean Air Program, which provides an overarching framework for national, for air quality management in the country, it primarily focuses on the need for city specific uh, air quality plans and strategies. Even the announcement of uh, you know, dedicated financing for urban agglomeration underlines a significant contribution that local governments, which is our municipal corporations, our Nagar Parishads, our Nagar Panchayats, need to play in mitigating air pollution. However, what the existing research on air pollution tells us is that even if we look at the urban centers, about one third of the pollution in these urban centers actually comes from sources which are outside the city's jurisdiction. And if we talk about Delhi in particular, there are times when more than 50% of the pollution actually comes from sources outside of Delhi. Now against this backdrop, how do we inspire action and accountability from the different tiers of the government? The question is who are the key actors in the game and how do we operationalize a plan that prioritizes local action as well as regional alignment. With that, let's move to our panelists and try and unpack some of these questions. Once again, a very warm welcome to our panelists. A quick note for the panelists, um, I would request you to keep your interventions to under seven minutes so that we have a uh, round for two sets of sort of questions and back and forth. Uh, and I'd like to use the last you know, couple of minutes to recapitulate what we hear and try and lend a way forward for the issue in hand. 
Uh, with that, uh, let's get started. So my first set of questions, they're not really questions, sort of, I'd ask Ms. Anumita to reflect over uh, the scientific rationale behind the need for interstate coordination. Of course, when we think of uh, regional coordination, the first example that comes to our minds is of stubble burning and you know the influence of uh, burning in Punjab and Haryana and Western Uttar Pradesh on Delhi's air quality. But could you perhaps explain to us that you know at, at a national level, if you look at the different states uh, in in our country, which are the states which could potentially impact? you know, or could benefit the most from, from regional strategies? And also, which are some of the sectors beyond just agriculture burning, which could again benefit from regional alignment? Over to you, Ms. Anuta. Thank you so much, um, Panushree, for that great introduction. And, and very clearly what you have said, that uh, air pollution knows no boundary. And even though science is uh, evolving quite rapidly now around this issue, but first, the public understanding of this phenomenon is actually the winter pollution. When we know that when all of us kind of make Delhi and NCR the poster boy of pollution during winter, I mean, very few realize that, that when Delhi is enwrapped in pollution, it is the entire Indo-Gangetic plain around that time. And what is very important to notice that during that period, there are towns or smaller cities in the Indo-Gangetic Plain who otherwise have much lower annual average levels of pollution. But when you have winter smog episode, they can have levels which is much higher than or equal to Delhi's pollution. That essentially brings out the fact of the regional level entrapment of pollution that happens because of the atmospheric conditions. And the other experience that we have gone through during the hard lockdown phase, when we all saw the blue sky, you know, one of the reasons why pollution cleaned up so quickly was actually not only the reduction in the local pollution, but also dramatic reduction in the regional influence of pollution. Now, if we have understood that within that context, therefore, we have now there's a lot more improved monitoring and modeling techniques that are available. And the scientists are constantly telling us with the help of satellite data and other data that how it is possible now to track the regional movement of pollution at its influence and the gradient of it. And it's interesting to see now these studies emerging in Delhi NCR, Indo-Gangetic Plain, Bihar, even West Bengal, where I'm seeing studies that are actually quantifying that how much of pollution is coming from outside. And the commonly what they're saying essentially that we need an air shed approach, even though we do not have a very clear definition of that yet, that what is that air shed approach is all about, but broadly it is understood a geographic area with unique air mass, um, a common topography, meteorology, climatic conditions, and similar pollution dispersion patterns. So somewhat like that, <clears throat> and therefore this means that the moment you begin to delineate like that, it becomes a multi-jurisdictional problem. And uh, which includes then not only different states, but also rural and urban landscape. And that's where we need to be. So very quickly, if you look at, and now we are seeing studies that how this delineation is happening, in terms of Western and Central Indo-Gangetic Plain, Central and Eastern Indo-Gangetic Plain, even the Middle India, including East Gujarat, Maharashtra. So we are beginning to understand now, but what is more powerful is to see the evidences today in Delhi NCR particular, where we know that the source apportionment studies mm -hmm. that have been carried out like Terry area and others, mm -hmm. and they are showing very clearly that how the huge part, and in fact, in Delhi, they are saying it can be between 50 to 70% of the winter pollution and 50% of summer pollution that can come from outside. We also have IITM's decision support system that is a dynamic forecasting of how different pollution sources are contributing to Delhi's pollution. And even that shows, but what is important, we always see how much pollution is coming to Delhi, but Delhi is also contributing. Now, uh, so in fact, the source apportionment study showing that Delhi is also contributing about 28% in summer and 40% in winter to Noida's pollution. Now, this clearly brings out the whole idea of the upwind states and the downwind states. 
And therefore, when we move forward, the message is very clear that local action is clearly affected by transboundary flux of pollution over the uh, whole plain. But what it means is that if all regional sources are not accounted for in this, uh, then what happens is, and if we just focus only on the city and the municipal boundary, then more than half of the pollution cannot be addressed by the local authorities. And therefore, it defeats the purpose. So today, therefore, when NCAP is asking cities to reduce their pollution levels and setting a target for that, but if half of the pollution is outside the jurisdiction of the city, how can the city then meet that target? And large number of pollution and rural pollution, household pollution remain outside that ambit. So therefore, what is important from learning from that science that those who are exporting pollution from the upwind to downwind, when they prepare their action plan, they need to account for that contribution. And the recipients, because the recipients who are receiving it, they do not have control over them. So therefore, when you do the integrated planning, we need that regional delineation and, air, and that the air pollution management and the, this interstate transboundary will now have to be the focus and focus of the regulations. And that's something that I can reflect on later. But that's what science is telling us very powerfully today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Anumit. I think uh, very important points here. I mean, one thing which is coming across very clearly is that the focus is still on urban centers. And the second bit is that while we have the discourse around airship management has begun, we still don't really know how to delineate these airships. I mean, there is there is a philosophical understanding as to say, but there is still a limited scientific understanding of how do we sort of ascribe boundaries to these airships. But there is one airship which has actually been sort of defined and there is also uh, you know, a regulatory body which has been put in place to manage this airshed. And I'm, of course, talking about the Delhi and National Capital Region. As we know, uh, the Commission on Air Quality Management uh, in Delhi NCR and adjoining areas was first uh, brought in by an ordinance in 2020. And then finally, a bill was passed uh, in August 2021, and which led to sort of uh, institutionalization of the CAQM. And this year, uh, CAQM has issued certain directions which are kind of regional in nature. So there is, we could say in a way that we are moving towards the thinking around need for interstate coordination and regional coordination, especially for the Delhi NCR region. Uh, at this point, I would like to bring in Ms. Reena Gupta. Uh, Reena Gupta, you know, as, as I, I, I included in my introduction for her, uh, advises the Delhi government and, and she's had close encounters with the CAQM. So Ms. Ms. Gupta, I would like you to reflect upon, you know, uh, how, how do you perceive uh, CAQM's action this year on uh, Delhi NCR's winter pollution? What went right? What went wrong? What could be done? Uh, thank you, Tanushri. And, uh, you know, I'm really grateful that uh, Air Asia and Observer Research Foundation, even, you know, at, almost at the beginning of March, where all discussions related to air pollution have died down, all the pundits have gone home only to come back next year. So I'm really glad that you're, you know, keeping this discussion alive, uh, uh, you know, when the air quality has improved to a great extent, at least in the Nevi NCR area. Uh, having said that, you know, I also, uh, you know, um, Anumita spoke really well on uh, on how important airshed is, and a lot of my conversation I'm going to focus around Delhi NCR, but this will hold true for any region uh, across, you know, especially in the north, north in northern India or across the country actually. So if we look at um, uh, if we look at the Delhi NCR area, uh, Tanushri, you're right that you know CAQM was was created with much fanfare, uh, with an ordinance and then an act, but uh, Two winters have gone since CAQM was created. And uh, I'm very, very sorry to see say that I, am, I haven't seen much action. We still don't have uh, an agreed action plan for the NCR region. Do we have a long-term, short-term, annual kind of a plan that in the next 10 years, these are the actions that need to be taken in the NCR region? And who are the governments with state or city governments that are responsible for each of these actions? How will they fund these actions? Who will, you know, uh, who will allocate the budget for these actions? 
nothing like this has happened first winter i was you know we didn't expect much okay the second winter is also gone now and um, also you know caqm it's not really accountable to anybody i mean i want to see more political representation in caqm it should not become a body for retired babus to sit there um uh, why are the uh, say environment ministers of the ncr region who actually are accountable to the citizens of their area why are they not part of caqm you know if if i were to really uh, draw an example to my mind the gst council in in a certain extent actually is a very good body where certain actions are taken agreed upon act, you know decisions are taken and then the governments actually the state governments are held accountable in this case caqm just sits there and passes directions to the states and a lot of time these d- directions do not really have a scientific basis you know when uh, i've been very critical of epca also in the past but uh, to epca's credit epca had a, a very good sort of research mindset so even now if you look at delhi ncr a lot of the research reports uh, which epca did at that time are still being used by by state governments to take actions for their own states in case of caqm have you seen any new research come out any forward looking policy which has come out saying that this is how delhi ncr will solve its air quality crisis you haven't seen anything also what has happened is that uh, a lot of times what happens is every year the supreme court passes some ad hoc directions uh, because it feels that nobody is doing anything and then it passes a lot of these ad hoc directions being in delhi a lot of times we face the brunt of these ad hoc directions now shut down schools uh, you know this time around uh, power plants were shut down the polluting power plants now my question is that we know these power plants are polluting we have known for almost a decade now and so many judgments have been passed these power plants don't even produce too much electricity then why don't why doesn't anybody take action and actually say that no till they install clean technology they should just be shut down this is to my mind one of the lowest hanging fruits in the ncr region that can be taken care of you know again this time around caqm said that all the industry running on dirty fuel will be shut down for the pollution period why for the pollution period these industri- industries which are using dirty fuel should be da- shut down forever but again i mean who's going to take their action if the state governments are not taking their action then who will penalize the state governments so uh, it becomes very very depressing that year in and year out we discuss the same issues of uh, shutting down of polluting power plants shutting down of polluting industries uh, brickens not using proper technology all of that and also for delhi what happens is that of course as uh, both of you said you know a lot of pollution in delhi comes from outside delhi uh, almost two third of of it according to the latest uh, uh, csc report and also delhi contributes to the pollution in, in the downstream states but you know the actions when we take actions in delhi as a result of those actions a lot of the economic activity actually shuts down in delhi right so if we are saying that uh, industries not running on certain kind of fuel will not be allowed in delhi those industries just move outside delhi and move to the neighboring states but the air should remains the same so delhi loses on its economic activity on its revenue but the air doesn't get cleaner again in the last uh, couple of months uh, delhi has come out with two three very progressive policies and i would like to talk about two of them uh, one policy is where we are mandating all the aggregators to move towards electric vehicles uh now again this is a policy that should be taken for the whole ncr region because now what we are trying to do is we are trying to figure out how do we implement this policy uh if we say that in delhi uh, aggregators have to move to electric vehicles what stops those aggregators from registering those vehicles in the neighboring states so now we are trying to you know figure out complicated implementation arrangement but if the whole ncr uh, region governments were to sit down and say that this is important for uh, for the ncr region because vehicular pollution and two wheel vehicular pollution contributes to a large extent to the air, um, air quality of delhi let's all agree and take these ta- uh, time bound actions that didn't happen again uh, another policy which is in the making is 
uh, that if vehicles do not have a valid pollution under control certificate, POCC certificate, they will not be allowed to fill petrol, diesel in Delhi. Now, again, the same thing, right? What stops those vehicles to go to Noida and Gurgaon and just fill their, uh, you know, uh, fill their petrol, diesel fuels from there? So all of these things will become much, much easier if we have an NCR level body, uh, a regional airshed kind of a body, which, say, which, you know, which gets us all on the same table. Uh, I can give a, you know, an, a personal example. Before this pollution season, the Delhi government, the environment minister, the chief minister, they wrote to all the neighboring states saying that, you know, it was, it was I think, in September, saying that, you know, the pollution season is again around the corner. Let's all sit down and figure out how are we going to, you know, what actions can we take in terms of stubble burning or some of the other things. And you all sit down. No, no, nobody came on board. Uh, we also wrote to the central environment minister saying that, can you bring everybody together? Yeah. Reena, I'm sorry I'm interrupting. We will come back to this point. There okay. is a specific question around this, uh, but, but we will come back to this point. My, my one last point, Tanushri, sure. also, um, is that if you look at uh, NCAP is the only centrally funded scheme right now, and it is so badly designed. Uh, first of all, Delhi has not received NCAP money uh, for the longest time. I think this time around we are going to get some money. But again, uh, for NCAP also, the city, state, or the regions, will need to agree on time-bound targets. And these targets should be, uh, they should be for all of us to see. You know, we should say that by such and such date, these are the five actions that Delhi government will take, Haryana government will take, Punjab government will take. Then citizens in each of those states can say that, look, you agreed to all of this. Citizens can hold their own uh, governments accountable. Right. Right now, it's like nobody cares. And in the end, it's us who are, you know, suffering because of the bad air quality. So I'll stop there unless you have any specific questions. All right. That's that's a very good segue into the question that I actually have for Abhishek. So we've talked about the airshed level coordination, which is basically, in a way, being attempted with its own set of challenges in Delhi NCR. I think the larger question here is about accountability. Where does the buck really stop? But if we, if we take a step back, if we move sort of outside of the Delhi NCR region, and now we reflect over the National Clean Air Program, which is, uh, you know, the overarching framework for air quality management in the country. So Abhishek, what do you see NCAP sort of responding to this need for regional coordination? Uh, I know there is, you know, it, it alludes to some kind of institutional arrangements for implementation of the NCAP, but, but what are your reflections on it? What, what could ideally be or what should be a starting point to think about these institutional arrangements? Well, thank you, Anumita. Uh, pleasure to uh, be talking to you on the other side of the table. We had a lot of brainstorming sessions on air pollution together. Uh, Pleasure meeting, Anumita. Reena ji, you've given a lot of loud thoughts in my mind to come in, and I'll reflect uh, on some of them, linking with what Anumita has said. Um, <clears throat> I first of all want to give you a sense, straight out first reaction to your question. Yes, NCAP does allow some kind of regional coordination mechanisms, but I think the question is more fundamental than that, and Reena ji has spoken about it, and I'd like to build upon it. See, institutions are of three kinds. Institutions that are driven by constitutional mandate, institutions that are driven by parliament acts, and institutions which are basically created at ministerial level. Um, if you look at Article 21, which, is a, which has a constitutional mandate, which is right to life, and air pollution is quite central to Article 21. So there is a constitutional, con constitutionality and constitutional mandate uh, when we look at air pollution as a problem, which is now in, over the last decade or so, has become uh, recognition has really uh, taken uh, another level of discourse has really shaped around it. Now, the issue is um, there are, to me, this problem is not just a technical problem. I mean, there is a lot of technical data that is available. Uh, uniformity, rationalization of, the, of that data is something that we keep on working. It will keep on getting refined. But I think to my mind, the problem is more political. Uh, the more political, because for the very reason that Reema Ji has spoken about, for the very reason that you have spoken about, and also Anumita has spoken about, um, the problem is 
fugitive in nature. It cannot be controlled by city level action plans. Neither can it be controlled by state governments. So there needs to be a political consensus on how do we basically solve the problem rather than shifting the blame game. Fortunately, the same constitution which recognizes under right to life uh, the uh, the importance of uh, tackling air pollution as a problem also provides for a fantastic mechanism which has been underutilized. Since our last discussion, uh, uh, Tanushree and uh, Bashok Brian Shimla, where we did discuss some of the aspects of interstate coordination, I was actually reflecting on this uh, because otherwise this will remain a fugitive problem to even address. And that mechanism is within Article 263 of the Constitution, uh, which talks about interstate council secretariat. Now, I'm not very sure the last time I heard that constitutional body really uh, coming out with something which is, uh, which is as crucial as air pollution. When I see NCAP or when I see CAQM, these are all things that can be subsumed within the inter, inter council secret, uh, secretariat. Uh, the reason is that the prime minister still heads it. There is a political, um, and although it may come under home ministry, but the fact is that there are zonal councils which are structured in it, which are conversing on a number of issues, but I have not seen air pollution being mainstreamed within that constitutional framework. The challenge of a constitutional body would be, because there is a constitutionality associated with it, some of the decisions that state governments take in order to address trade-offs um, will not be that easy, right? Uh, uh, the rhetoric and the uh, and the reality uh, will have to be matched when it is coming from a constitutional body mandate. So I think if we can address that challenge, air pollution can itself be one agenda to revive interstate cooperation through a constitutional mechanism of interstate council. And there's a good reason why all these things could be subsumed within within that. Now, coming back to some of the other issues, which I see very well can be taken within that, uh, can be addressed within that framework. I mean, what are the issues that we're dealing with? We are, issue, we are dealing with how do you really classify non-attainment cities? Should we only look at non-attainment cities? Should we go beyond that? Should the data frameworks be uh, rationalized, standardized, harmonized? Um, I mean, uh, sh should there be customization of action plans, or should there be uniformity in action plan? We've seen that a lot of times, we've seen same kind of plans being replicated elsewhere. Now, these are the questions that can be more effectively dealt with when we have a, uh, when we have a more structured uh, body under ISC, and that would also help us avoid, avoid profligacy of institutions that are dealing with air pollution and will probably help us converge it better. So I'll leave my initial thoughts over there and we can take on just very two quick reactions, Reema. You mentioned something about decommissioning of plants and everything. So these are important questions because there are a lot of power plants which have gone of age, but uh, I don't know about Delhi, but when I do see other states, one of the problems that are tying up uh, these plants from not getting decommissioned is the huge amount uh, that are owed to these plants by dis distribution companies. I can give you in Rajasthan alone, I mean, it runs in 25,000 crores. So if I decommission it, I don't have a roadmap currently. So there, so what, what discussions like these can really do is that you can look at the problem more from a political lens also, and not just from a technical lens. I think that's, that's a bridge we need to make. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abhishek. I think some very sharp thoughts there. Uh, one is, you know, we're still considering air pollution to be, uh, you know, a more technical challenge rather than a political challenge. Uh, I honestly love the proposition around, you know, linking, you know, the interstate councils and then sort of using air pollution to make them a little more mainstream. Um, on the topic of mainstreaming, I think that's also a perfect segue to kind of bring in Dr. Mohammad Javed, who is a member of parliament. Um, Dr. Javed, I think my question for you is that how is the political thinking around air pollution shaping up in our country today? And how do we ensure that uh, you know, air pollution becomes a more mainstream issue? It's currently a very marginal issue if you think about it. You know, There's one isolated program called the National Clean Air Program. So how, how do we sort of mainstream uh, thinking and in particular political thinking around air pollution in the country? Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, I would like to uh, switch off my video because the connectivity uh, in where I'm sitting right now is not so great. So I'll put 
across my points in two minutes and answer, try and answer your question. Well, the thing is, uh, right now, I'm a Kishan guy. And I would like to tell you uh, that this is one of the places where you have no industry at all. But the air quality, as of today, is uh, moderately polluted. And uh, the air quality of today in Delhi is slightly better than what it is uh, in Kishingan right now. So the, it, it, is, it is the effect of the other places which have uh, industries uh, which pollute or thermal powers or similar things uh, around uh, this place or maybe it could be maybe miles and miles away from here. So uh, regarding uh, what the parliamentarian can do, uh, we would like uh, very much that uh, the state government's concerned and also the central government needs to take up this issue very seriously. I as a parliamentarian had uh, uh, put up a private member's bill on uh, 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 making compulsory to set up solar panels on government buildings and uh, big uh, uh, society uh, societies uh, so that uh, more green energy could be produced. We could stress and uh, make it more uh, viable for uh, people to afford uh, electrical vehicles and switch over to uh, green energy, like environmental friendly energies. So uh, these are the things I think uh, the government of today, uh, be it whoever is in the center and uh, whoever is in the state, needs to uh, really look into this. Uh, mm, well, anything else you would like to know? And yeah. Yes, I think you've, you've actually raised a very important point here. You know, you, you're speaking from your constituency and you've indicated that there are no industries as such. But yeah. still, uh, as of today, uh, Kishan Ganj is more polluted than Delhi is. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the local challenges? You know, I mean, I think what we've started, the way we are thinking about air pollution is, you know, we have like a plan. Uh, these plans are very similar across different cities, but these local challenges in particular are not being accounted for. So as much as we need interstate coordination, uh, primacy also needs to be given to understanding the local challenges. So given that you're speaking from your constituency, could you give us a flavor of what the challenges are? Uh, and, you know, if, if there are any uh, sort of national policies which are in a way not related to air pollution, but are trying to address some of these local challenges. I'm sure uh, the government uh, is trying to uh, uh, take this matter, but it needs to be taken much more seriously. And uh, and uh, when you talk about uh, what how we tackle this, uh, you uh, you can suggest as to how we can sitting in Kishangan uh, tackle the air. It has to be tackled from wherever the uh, polluted air is coming from. Like it is, if it is coming from uh, stubble burning or uh, uh, too much uh, vehicular movement uh, leading to more pollution, uh, too many uh, uh, polluting industries. So those are the areas that need to be uh, monitored. You know, uh, to 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 there has to be some sort of mechanism to control. Uh, such industries or such units which uh, pollute uh, the air quality. So uh, that needs to be seriously taken up. And uh, of course, we cannot uh, uh, think about uh, um, making uh, industries also unviable. So maybe the government uh, uh, should come up with some subsidies and, you know, to sort of balance the, the whole thing. So that uh, the employment is also there, the industries also survive, and also the uh, pollution uh, that uh, they, they, they contribute to uh, also is uh, in a controlled uh, level. So, uh, yeah, that, that's what thank I can you, suggest. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Javed. Very interesting points there. So uh, what should be the extent of regulation is the question. How stringent should regulation be? Should 
stringency in regulation, let's say, make industrial production unviable. And I would like to bring in some thoughts here from the rest of the panelists as well, because uh, typically what we see in the case of Delhi NCR is that with approaching winters, there is an onslaught of emergency directions. Okay, you're targeting the farmers and suddenly you're targeting construction sites and then you're targeting industries, uh, you know, emergency bans, shutdown on operations. What is going on here? I mean, is this really the right strategy to mitigate air pollution, uh, ad hoc emergency directions? How do we balance between the needs or between the interests of the different groups? Uh, I'm talking about the small and you know micro industrial enterprises. I'm talking about construction workers who are very badly affected due to bans on construction sites. I'm also talking about farmers. Uh, so some thoughts around that. But how do we balance between interests of these different groups uh, and air pollution? I will I will come to you, Veena, first, because we've seen, you know, the Delhi government actually doling out payments to uh, construction workers because of the ban on construction sites. But with some reflection around this, do you see this as a sustainable solution, these emergency bans? No, Tanushri, I mean, uh, these uh, ad hoc reactions, as we know, uh, will not work because uh, it's not just in winter. If you look at the NCR region, uh, we've, we've over the years sort of normalized pollution. Uh, even today, I think the AQI is around 200 in Delhi. Uh, this is not the kind of AQI we should be living in. So first of all, as a country, we need to, uh, to acknowledge that this is a serious problem across the country. There are several pockets. If you go to southern India, the area around Chennai, that even though it's a, it's a coastal city, the air quality is extremely bad over there. Bombay, coastal city, again, the air quality is bad. Calcutta, the air quality is bad. But, uh, and I keep coming back to, you know, uh, the role of the political leaders. As a country, we are still not uh, acknowledging how big this problem is. Number one, also... You know, in my discussions with a lot of policymakers, I feel they're still living in that era of, you know, the, the sort of Kuznet curve era, where they feel that we are a developing country, we will pollute. And after a point, we'll have the resources to clean up. But in this era of climate change and all, we know that that's not how it works. This is really old economics. We need to move beyond this. And we really need to agree on sort of a green agenda and say that, Okay, industries are required. Uh, electricity is required. But I will not allow polluting power plants to continue to run unless they install clean technology. Because even if you look at the economics of these power plants, uh, if you were to quantify the health impacts of pollution versus the economic uh, impact, you know, the economic cost of de decommissioning these power plants, I'm very, very sure that the health impacts will be much, much bigger. So unless, you know, we, we start taking these actions saying that health is important, good air quality is important. And so these kind of, uh, uh, these kind of things will not be allowed in the country. Uh, and that has to be something which has to be led by the central government. Uh, you know, the prime minister needs to speak on this. Uh, the whole pollution season, there was not a single statement from the central government on the whole, whole issue where... You know, if you look at Indo-Gangetic Plain, that's like 30-40% of the population of the country. So, you know, all of that population is breathing very, very toxic air. You go to tier two, th uh, tier three cities, the air is even worse off. My parents live in Muradabad. I mean, you cannot breathe over there. Nobody is talking. I mean, Delhi NCR is the poster child. Every year it gets discussed. But what about tier two, tier three cities? We don't even have air quality monitors. So uh, the point that I want to make, Tanushree, is as a country, we have to say that air pollution is a problem. We have to say that we will put in all our resources that are required to solve this crisis. Only then I can see some action happening. Otherwise, we'll keep having the Supreme Court step in, give out some ad hoc directions, which you know the state governments are just like running around trying to make sure that you know uh, we comply to whatever the Supreme Court says. And there is no long-term discussion on the long-term measures which need to be taken. Thank you. Fantastic points there, Rina. But underlying messages, accountability. Where does the buck stop? 
whether the buck stops with the local government, the state government, or with the central government. Uh, and I'm going to throw this question to both. So let me let me just add, uh, Tarushi. Sorry. Thirty seconds, Rina. Because thirty seconds. Running. Yes, thirty the seconds. The buck stops with each of us. Each okay. of the the central, state, local governments, but there needs to be a plan that each of these governments need to implement, and that plan would only come from the central government along with budgets for that plan. All right, all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna shift this question to uh, Anumita and uh, thinking a little more from the financial lens. I mean, we've seen how you know the state has intervened and the center has intervened, particularly in the case of stubble management. You know, there is the central subsidy, and then uh, the court mandated the state government to pay compensation to the farmers. So in a way, both the state and the center have you know, pay, taken up the financial burden for managing stubble. So if we, if we think about it from that lens, where, what should be the financial mechanism? What, what should be, who should bear the financial burden, especially in case of situations where there is a regional impact? First Anumita and then Amishik. Right. Two minutes, please. Absolutely. And great insight from, you know, Reena, Javedji and Abhishek. So very quickly, what I'll say that even before you can begin to have a financial strategy, it's important to have the regulatory strategy in place. As of now, only in Delhi NCR, because of Supreme Court intervention and now with the commission, there is a mandate to regulate over the jurisdiction of NCR and adjoining areas, which has been legally mandated. But otherwise, we do not have any idea like what Abhishek said about an interstate council or any framework, but how do you really operationalize it? Now, in that operational framework, you require two level of two approaches. One is how do you legalize a regional approach? And in that, we know technically today, even under the AIR Act, it is possible to do that because AIR Act provides for the, to declare an area as a critically polluted area. But it is very narrowly applied today to only industrial area, but you can broaden that to bring a larger jurisdiction within the planning process, that integrated planning that we are talking about. The second part of it is in that, uh, uh, that whole approach, even though we are looking at say something like a commission or an interstate council for that vertical uh, uh, you know, top down uh, management, but we still have to understand the power of the federalism that the state governments have enormous power and they can take extra steps to deal with that and for harmonize action. Now, within that, therefore, when you are looking for a funding strategy, what we are realizing that while at one level, you need to certainly augment resources and funding for the cleaner action. And as has happened in Punjab and Haryana, we recognize the problem and therefore both central and the state government funding strategies have evolved. But what is very important that current is interesting that in all the sectors of pollution, both central and state government funding are happening already. For if you look at the Swatch Bharat Survection of the central government and what it has given performance linked funding to all the ULBs, why aren't we leveraging that? But we don't see that leveraging when we go to the ground level, either for renewable energy, whether for uh, uh, the, uh, the waste management or uh, transportation plants, none of this leveraging is happening across the sector. So clearly that framing is very critical. And then to augment, the so one is to align the old money and then to get the new money. And in that, very quickly, I'll just say that. And in that new money, what is important for us to see that NCAP or the urban local body funding that has come, they have not even treated NCR as a, as a locus for funding. I think okay. NCAP has given no fund to NCR and urban local body, I think two ULBs have got funding. So what I'm saying that today, first fix that regulatory framework like the US does in terms of good neighbor policy, making okay. upstream down in accountable, and then align all the funding streams in that to, and, uh, to be able to leverage the action and uh, you know, to find the right resources and at a regional scale. Because otherwise, I, I'm sorry, I have to cut you short, but very interesting points. Abhishek, I wanted to reflect on one point. We have the frameworks, but we are not leveraging them enough. Your thoughts? Two minutes, please. Uh, you know, I'll take a minute. I'll keep it very, very pithy. Uh, and I'm going to go back to what I earlier said. Uh, even before I come to frameworks and leveraging, you guys ad hoc versus regulation. Let's just say what is the way forward and where we can get some solutions. Regulators, the, 
regulation is a good idea, but regulators are out of depth today. We know in every sector. And the problem with regulation is that uh, very rarely regulators' decisions are also even challenged in court uh, because they're supposed to have the requisite expertise. Courts, on the other hand, are also not able to take holistic view. And I can give you a number of examples that have come at the intersection of public health and emissions and pollution. Uh, one that comes to my mind is that when BS3 vehicles were uh, stopped and really all of those vehicles found their way on the road. Uh, there is a third level. Um, this, I think sometimes informal processes with a hint of form formality around it are far more effective than actually creating a regulatory, very stringent regulatory framework around it. And what I mean by interstate council framework, which is which can have that constitutional and political backing, is that you can have a lot of informal interactions within that uh, larger umbrella as, as well. They're not, they, they need not be limited only to minister from minister to minister, but they, they can be track two and track three. And the last thing is um, the, the people who are impacted, they really find their space uh, in that framework of regulate, regulatory framework. And I'm picking on regulation. You see Electricity Act. Electricity Act specifically provides for state advisory committee in uh, state regulator uh, regulatory bodies. And SSEs, uh, the law says that they may be established. Some states establish them. Some states don't establish, establish them. So I think there is a great space to accommodate within the regulatory structure, consumer bodies, civil society bodies, which are basically bearing the impact. The only problem is that there has to be a framework of getting their voices involved because there are different kinds of civil society organizations also. You have service delivery, you have policy advocacy, and you have monitoring and evaluation. If these are the three categories, how do we basically put them in the regulatory structure? So again, this will provide that mezzanine layer, which is outside the technical uh, uh, technical uh, 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 con confines, uh, specifically speaking. And the last point that I would like to say is that you know, very planning, yeah, Bishik. planning commission used to have perspective planning. I mean, urbanization have a lot of positives. For instance, you have knowledge spillovers and economies of ag agglomeration, but the perspective planning at state level and central level, again, through an institutional framework will help us say, think about how can the core positives uh, be, be taken on board when you are expanding into rural areas. So that is not happening. We are addressing the conversation right as of now, what is happening today. Right. And five years down the line, we will continue to have that conversation if the planning from a perspective planning is, is not instituted formally and informally both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abhishek. Very interesting points from all the panelists. It's going to be very difficult to wrap up in 30 seconds. But what we've heard is think of air pollution, not just as a technical problem, but as a problem of political involvement. Uh, it has to be mainstreamed in larger political thinking and policy making in the country. I thought the interstate council point was extremely valid. We've not really leveraged this to think about, uh, you know, how the regional coordination mechanism should be like. So I'm sure that that is one of the way forwards that we can think of. Uh, and finally, we need more participatory governance. Uh, where is the impacted community involved in air quality planning in the country? Uh, so yay for participatory governance, even for air quality management. Uh, that's a wrap from this session. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming everyone who tuned and learned a lot from the session uh, and looking forward to more such discussions in the coming months. Let's keep talking about air pollution. Let the buzz not die. Thank you so much. That's a wrap from my end.